Hey there, students. In this next segment of intensive review, we're going to take a look at the Marshall Court, USHC 1.7. And what we're going to look at are the decisions of the Marshall Court and how the Marshall Court really continue to have a Federalist presence in the central government even after the Federalists cease to be competitive on a national level politically. So the election of 1800 was the so-called Revolution of 1800, where the Jeffersonian Democratic Republicans are elected. And Jefferson said, I shall, by the establishment of Republican principles, sink federalism into an abyss from which there shall be no resurrection. Doesn't quite do that. Okay, because it might seem like the clock's ticking for the Federalists, this so-called doomsday clock. Uh, some scientists have it. When it gets to midnight, evidently the whole world's going to blow up in a nuclear war. But this is what's kind of going on for the Federalists, it seems, in 1801, that they're about to leave office. And, you know, everything's just screwed. But they realize something because they can continue to harass the Jeffersonians from the judiciary. So what we've got during Adams' lame duck period. Now the lame duck period is that time between when one president is elected and another president takes office. See, okay, the president's elected, takes office. The old president sits there as kind of a caretaker. Well, in a lame duck session of Congress, you can get a lot of things done, especially if your party just lost an election and you really want to stick it to the people, all right, uh, just for not voting for you and that sort of thing. And so in this lame duck session in 1801, before the successor's term starts, what we see here is that in Article 3 of the Constitution, the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. So what the Constitution says is that there's one Supreme Court and Congress really has a lot of leeway in determining how many lower courts, how many judges, how many justices on the Supreme Court and all of that. So all of that is set by congressional legislation. And what we see here in the Judiciary Act of 1801, we see 16 new federal circuit judges. So what happens here, how long do federal judges serve? For life or on good behavior, okay, as long as they stay within their powers and don't do anything too outrageous or stupid. But 16 new federal judges that can receive confirmation from Congress and will be Federalists. Now John Marshall was not one of these new circuit judges, but he was Adams' Secretary of State and a Federalist, a cousin of Jefferson, but not on Jefferson's side politically. And he was made Chief Justice in one of these midnight appointments. Now, the midnight judges are called such because the minutes are ticking to midnight. And John Adams is putting these people on the bench so that there will be a Federalist legacy in the government and they will serve for life. Now, then we see Marbury v. Madison which this is kind of the case that starts the whole, the Supreme Court actually being something. Hamilton said that the judiciary would be the least threatening of the branches in the Federalists because he's responding to anti-Federalists who said this judiciary is going to become very powerful. One day it'll strike down state laws and stuff like that. And Federalists are like, no, of course not. Now, Marbury v. Madison, William Marbury, who's one of the midnight judges, and James Madison, who was the Secretary of State. Well, what happened was John Adams and John Marshall, before they got out of office, they didn't give all the commissions out, all right? They made these judges, they signed the papers, but they didn't deliver the commissions. And before you deliver the commissions, it's not official. So what happened is James Madison was going to his desk as Secretary of State, and John Marshall had left him a little note. Would you mind delivering all these commissions to these Federalist judges who hate you? And James Madison is thinking, no, okay? Runs by Jefferson, they're just like, toss these, okay? We'll put our own people in there. Now, William Marbury sues and he says, no, 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 no. I got a commission, he has to deliver it. And what he asked for is a writ of mandamus as per the Judiciary Act of 1789, which Congress said that the Supreme Court could issue a writ of mandamus in cases like this saying that you have to do this. And so in Federalist number 78, which I just referred to offhand, the judiciary from the nature of its functions will always be the least dangerous to the political rights of the Constitution. Now, Marshall's dilemma. Is Marshall going to tell James Madison what he has to do? 
and risk James Madison saying, make me. Oh, yeah, that's right. The executive branch is controlled by Jefferson. So it's a dilemma because Marshall would probably like for this Federalist judge to get his commission, but he's thinking in terms of the battle versus the war. And what Marshall decides to do is in Marbury v. Madison, he declares the Judiciary Act of 1789 unconstitutional and says that it is just, it's, it's against the, con the constitutional balance of powers and all of that, and therefore it is void. And this is the advent of judicial review, where the judiciary reserves the right to look at laws and examine them when they're brought before them and decide, is this law valid? Is this law constitutional? Which we see on the Supreme Court building, where in the Marbury v. Madison decision, John Marshall wrote, is it, it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. So this is a power that John Marshall is appropriating that's not specifically listed in the Constitution, but has become enshrined into our unwritten Constitution, into our small c Constitution. And so Marshall says the Supreme Court can declare laws to be unconstitutional, in this case, a federal law passed by Congress. So that's judicial review. Now, if we compare Jefferson and Marshall just very quickly, now keep in mind that Marshall is a Federalist. Jefferson is a Jeffersonian Republican, Democratic Republican, what have you, depending on what's on your exam. Now, as far as federalism is concerned, like Hamilton, Marshall wants a strong central government, whereas Jefferson was an advocate of states' rights. National Bank? No, okay? As far as construction of the Constitution, strict or loose construction, I've got it on a different order on the sheet than on the slides. My apologies there. I will work harder. All right, so let me just put everything kind of in front of you there. That they disagree on the construction of the Constitution. Remember, Jefferson strict, limit the power of the central government. And Marshall loose, little comic sansy kind of going on there that uh, we don't need to get too technical or anything. And, you know, National Bank, Marshall says it's constitutional. It's an implied power. Jefferson says it's not in the Constitution. It's invalid. And their favorite economic pursuit, Marshall, is thinking commerce. Jefferson, agriculture. And as far as who interprets the Constitution, Marbury v. Madison, the Supreme Court. And in Jefferson's Kentucky Resolution, he says that the states should interpret the Constitution. So we have that matter of whether it's the Supreme Court or the states. And of course, uh, we've kind of gone on the side of Marshall for the most part as far as how we do politics in the United States. And I will work on getting our guides in line with slides and all of that good stuff. And in the next segment, we'll be moving on to standard two. This gets us through standard one, which was a pretty big standard covering over 200 years of history. So standard two is going to take us through part of the antebellum period, going through sectionalism and all of that kind of stuff. So I certainly hope that you'll stay with us for that and you'll keep on reviewing with us. See you in a bit.